Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Dalmany Bible Church. It's good to be with you today. And uh, I love the sounds of community, people in the foyer celebrating fellowship and whatever, but come on in here. We're going to start, guys. And so welcome here. It's good to be in the Lord's house. Uh, we're going to start with something. We're going to do our announcements. We're going to start with something a little bit more heavy. Um, most of you know uh, Stan Scheller. He's been attending this church for a long time. Um, uh, Stan and, and Cheryl and their, and their family that are here. He had a heart attack this week and um, he's currently in the hospital and uh, we just, just very recently got a text from Cheryl and I guess things are quite serious. And so he's asking that we would, we would pray. So you know what, we're gonna do that right now. So would you just join me? Lord Jesus, we thank you that you care for us. We thank you that you are our great God that knows the beginning from the end, that when we don't understand the things that we go through, the hardness of life, the difficulties, Lord, we can still turn to you and we can trust you that, that we are in your hand and that your love never fails and that you have the power to turn situations that you can bring healing, that you can bring strength. And so at this time we lift up the Scheller family and we ask that you would be near to them in this most difficult of time. And we ask that, that you would strengthen Stan's body, guide the doctors and help him. Uh, Lord, this is our desire. And so Lord, we come before you as your church and we ask that you would be close to them and that you would intervene. And we ask this in Jesus' wonderful name, amen. So we're going to have a, just a couple of announcements before we head into our worship time. Uh, registration for the soccer camps is now being accepted online. And, and if someone you know um, would benefit from this, it's a wonderful opportunity. And, but finances are you know, stopping that from happening. There's scholarships available and sponsorships available. So please talk to Melissa and she will make sure that uh, the people that need to come can come. Uh, Registration is also open for the guys fishing weekend, which happens in September long. Um, when we invite fam fathers to bring their sons as well as men young and old to attend. And you can use the QR code or the link in the bulletin to register. Uh, for all youth, you need to pay attention. If you know youth, you're going to have to tap them on the shoulder this week. Things are changing a little bit because of scheduling. There's, uh, we're going to call it the spring shift is happening. Things are, are changing. The junior youth are going to meet on Tuesday. Okay, junior youth, grades, uh, you, know, you know who you are, at uh, Tuesday from 7 to 9 o'clock. I'm going to make sure I get the demographic right. If I get that wrong, that would be bad. Start inviting people that don't belong. Um, and the senior youth are going to be meeting on Thursday from 7.30 to 10 o'clock. Uh, last announcement, on May 28th, we'll be hosting the international director and program director for uh, stat, or SAT-7, and they will be sharing about the challenging story in the Middle East region through satellite TV. That sounds very interesting. They'll be, arrive, be arriving from Lebanon, and they will, are only in Canada for a week, so we're pri privileged to hear what God is going to do through that ministry. So let's transition into a time of worship. Would you stand with me um, as we dedicate this time to the Lord? Lord Jesus, we thank you that we are in your house. We thank you that you are here with us. And Lord, we give this time to you. Hear our praises, we ask. Turn our hearts towards you. And Lord, may you be speaking to us. In Jesus' name we ask, amen.
Even through the wall, through the valley, on the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back, I know you are near. I will fear no evil, for my God is with us. If my God is with me, whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I fear?
You can have a seat. We're going to move into a time of prayer. And, and uh, again, we're going to remember the Scheller family. And, and uh, also, if you're from the community, uh, you've likely heard that uh, Chief Rick Elder is having some significant sur surgeries this week. And so we want to lift him up in prayer and also all those that love and care for him. And, and also we're going to remember the uh, Mark and Wendy and the Buchert and Dasik families. As, you know, they've had a very difficult week in, with Daniel's uh, funeral. So those are a few of the things that will give you some context. And, and let's just join together in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you again that we can, we can gather together. Lord, that we thank you that we can come as those who follow you, who call ourselves your church. Lord, to, to bring the things that are heavy on our hearts this morning. And we do so because you've invited us to do that. Lord, that we know that uh, your presence is described as the throne of grace. And uh, Lord, we need your grace this morning. Lord, our heart breaks for those that are hurting, those that need a touch from you. And, and again, we just lift up Stan and his family and, and just strengthen him in this time of need. Be with Chief Elder as, as uh, he looks to uh, a time of some significant surgeries this week. And Lord, we, we ask that you would just bring him the best care. Uh, Lord, bring those around him that love and care for him and, and just uh, Lord, may he have the confidence of, of uh, his support systems as he's cared for so many. And uh, Lord, we ask that you, would, that you would just bring a positive outcome for him. For those that are experiencing loss, we, we pray for the Bugert and the, the Dasik family and, and Lord, for, for all those that have experienced loss in the last while like this reminds us of maybe who's not with us and, and Lord we, we lift them up and we ask that you would bring strength to them bring comfort to them and Lord that they would look to you for the strength to, to just move on to another day we Lord we thank you for the things that you allow us to do as your church for the different ministries we think of the soccer camp that's coming up the, the fishing trip and just these, these things that are built around things that we enjoy, but Lord, that you can use them to, to accomplish your purposes, and we, we thank you for that. We thank you for the opportunity that Emily Thiessen has to be on short-term missions this day and is, is worshiping in Germany rather than in Delmany. Just be with her, bless her, and, and make her a blessing. Lord, we pray that you'd be with the ladies as they're coming back from the retreat, and I pray that it would have been a, a rich time. And, and Lord, I pray that in the days that follow, that the relationships that were started there would continue, and that this would just be a real time of of growth for us as as a community and a, a real building of relationships. And, and Lord, again, as we continue to sing songs of praise and worship, we ask that through this that you would speak to us, that you would. Pull away the things and concerns of our week and help us to truly look to you. Lord, may you be praised, may you be glorified, but Lord, may you work in our lives. May your spirit speak to us about the things that we need to hear from you about. And uh, Lord, I just pray that through this time that you would, you would build us and you would teach us. And Lord, we give this all to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Fine. 
final day outside as Jesus rose. On that day, we will see you shining brighter than the sun. On that day, we will know you as we lift our voice as one. Till that day. Savior's throne. Though we grieve our losses, we grieve not in vain. For we know a crown of glory is beyond the grave. On the day we will see you shining brighter than the sun. On the day we will know you as we lift our voice as one. Till that day sir 
shine in the shadows You win every battle Nothing can stand against the power of our God Almighty fortress You go before us Nothing can stand against the power of our God You shine in the shadows children? No. We have no children today? Okay. <laughs> well, as you can see, we are hopeless people without our wives. <laughs> All of us. And we pray that they come home. Please come home. Please don't take a detour at Prince Albert. Come home. Yes. You know, I want to thank uh, the guys for doing this today. It's a lot of it's last minute. Actually, what's ironic, if you re read the theme of the songs and the walking through trials, actually Colton Scheller picked the songs for this morning, was going to lead. And uh, those songs speak of the trials they're facing right now as a family, as they're together at the hospital just um, praying and loving together as Stan goes through this challenge. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a week of weeks for people, weeks of weeks. And uh, we, we don't, uh, aren't, are also mindful that that's not everything. There's stuff in all our lives. And so we're not uh, being careless in this at all today. 
I'm thankful for those that are filling in. Several individuals, whoever you were, thank you for championing the classes downstairs this morning for all the people that were away. And uh, I even know that uh, Pastor Jaden just ended up driving up because Jen wasn't feeling well, so he left early this morning to go pick her up. Hopefully they're home soon as well. But we're going to try to change gears here, and I want to, like, um, like, not really change gears, <laughs> actually stay in the same gear, just maybe um, gear down in it and refocus our thoughts on some of the things we've been singing about together. My first position in church ministry was as a youth pastor. For some of you, I was just down the road in Martinsville back in 1984, clueless, but working as a youth pastor down in Martin, over in Martinsville. And one of the things that I decided to do, I thought would be really neat, was to expose our youth that we worked with to a significant outdoor challenge. And so I organized a backpacking trip to the mountains with a large group of them, a large group, larger than you'd normally take backpacking. And Faith and I were not yet married, but she came along as a chaperone for the teen girls on that trip. Now, having a group of boys and girls going backpacking, um, the boys just love to bug the girls as the boys do. And on one of our hikes, some of these guys, they had decided, they got it into their heads that they were secretly going to add weight to the packs of one of the girls. And so if she stopped for the, a drink, one of the guys would distract her and talk to her, and the other guy would grab a rock and he'd put it in her backpack. And then when they rested and took off their packs for a while, um, they would distract her again and they'd throw something else in. And this went on for some time with this young girl. And the boys thought they were so funny. They would just keep laughing and laughing. And... Uh, even though no harm was done in the process, I finally said, okay, enough's enough. You gotta come clean. I mean, that's a lot of weight. The girl's sweating. And uh, what was ironic was how much some of those same boys complained a day earlier how heavy their packs were. In fact, they were eating everything out of it because it was too heavy for them. <laughs> and then they were all comparing who had to carry more. Just an interest, when you're working with young people, guys and girls, it's just stuff comes out all the time. Um, when we come to faith in Christ, we become, I think, we can become much more alert to the reality of, well, the burdens in our lives and the lives of others in a different way, in a new way. Um, I don't think we should ever, as the, the people of God, be known as a community that places extra burdens on people or leaves them with an overwhelming burden to carry on their own. But instead, we should be a peeper, people that offers to help bear those weight, weights. We shouldn't be known as a people that pat ourselves on the back as we compare ourselves to others either. We should be known as burden bearers. Before we look into this passage, uh, I want to ask you to think about maybe some situations, some people. I mean, stuff that's going on today is pretty fresh in our mind, but maybe there's something else, that someone else that you're thinking of. Um, maybe a fellow Christian that's struggling right now. A fellow Christian. Um, someone who has nagging doubts. That's okay. Come, 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 come. Someone who has nagging doubts. Um, maybe someone who's maybe dug themselves a hole, they created division uh, with careless words. You're thinking about this person right now. Maybe someone you know that's made a really poor financial decision. Uh, maybe someone who is indiscreet in how they treated another person and that's got them in a lot of hot water. Um, maybe someone who's literally facing a crisis at this moment. Maybe it's a Christian friend a relative, one of your kids, someone you serve with at church. Question for you is, how do you think they're doing right now? You thinking about them? What, what they're going through? How are they doing? 
And how does that burden that they're bearing make you feel right now? Do they maybe even know they messed up? Do they feel hopeless or hopeful? Throughout this message, please keep that person prayerfully in your mind because as followers of Jesus, we have a mutual accountability to bear one another's burdens. Now secondly, are you facing a particular struggle right now? A a burden? Maybe the pressure of an important decision. Maybe you're finding it difficult to get into God's word on a regular basis and it's just, you, you, you feel that weight. Uh, Maybe you have the fear of someone finding out about a hidden obsession you have with either internet porn or the misuse of finances and that's just weighing on you. Um, Maybe you have a tendency to talk about others behind their back and you know that it's got you in trouble. Maybe there's an unresolved conflict you're in the middle of. Maybe your struggle right now is just, just a thought, a doubt a fear, anger, jealousy. Maybe it's just the weight of darkness. I would ask you to be prayerfully open to the personal responsibility that you have this morning as a follower of Jesus to address the burden in your life and to let others come alongside. We're going to pray, then we're going to look into our text. Lord, as the children receive the blessing of hearing your word downstairs, enrich their lives, bless those who lead them. As we look into your word and we reflect on um, thoughts that weigh us down or weigh others down, would you come alongside here today? Give us freedom, give us hope, and show us how we can love. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Our first verse that we're going to look at today is Galatians 5.26, where it says, Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. It's interesting, it's the last verse of chapter 5 that we were looking at before, but it actually should be the first verse of chapter 6, because it follows the thought of what we're going to look at after that. The previous section that we talked about the last time I led you in Galatians was uh, it, we address the reality of the conflict that goes on in a Christian's life. The battle, we just sang about a battle. And a battle between the flesh and the spirit. Who we were, the flesh, and how that was lived out before Jesus saved us, and who we are now that Jesus has saved us, and how that is lived out now in our lives as we battle the flesh, our past, with the spirit which is present. Life in the spirit is a result of knowing what Jesus' death has accomplished for me. It's a removal of that condemnation. It's the gift of a new life. It's an assurance of forgiveness. It's the indescribable peace an unconditional love that comes when we have the Spirit in our lives. It's a patient resilience to transform the way we think and act so that we reflect outwardly what Jesus is accomplishing inwardly in us. Just just the illustration of a tree or a grapevine where everything that happens in that tree is sustained in the center the core, as we abide in him, as he is our tree, as he is the vine, as we trust him, as we serve him, as we obey him, as we know him, not just some intermittent connection when we're feeling we can't do things on our own, but a dependent surrender that connects us to him, abiding with him, But it's the work of God that takes place in me and through me at that point. And the goal of all that is what? Paul said it's to bear the fruit. But the church in Galatia was working through some struggles. (laughs) Real struggles. Struggles that were actually dividing their church. Verse 26 talks about three specific struggles. Conceit. 
provocation and envy. It was, if, if, if I was to fill out a character reference, if some, because I do a lot of character references for people who go to camp, I don't think I'd get this reference. Hey, would you like to fill out a reference for Satan? Oh, sure, I'll fill out a reference for him. He'd get a check mark for all three of those. Yeah. It's what he's also trying to stir up in our lives. Conceit, as you have it there. It's being consumed with being recognized and affirmed. The attention on me. What about me? The word actually means vainglory. Glory that is vain for yourself. Not for God, but for you. It's arrogantly wanting others to give you the recognition that really only belongs to God. But it's a conceit. Provocation or provoking. A more common word would be the word to challenge. And to challenge here is to taunt someone. To taunt someone to a fight. I challenge you to a duel. Challenging them to a match. It's competition because there's something you want to prove to them that you're better. It's thinking higher of yourself than you ought to think. It's a superiority complex that says, I'm going to beat you, and I'm going to beat you really good. And then there's envy. It's being deeply upset that others have succeeded, or it can also mean that you really take pleasure when somebody else fails. Why? Because inwardly, this, if provoking means to feel superior, envy actually means I feel inferior. And since I can't beat you, well, I'll just hate you. How often have you had experiences where either you have acted out or it's been acted upon you, one of these three things, and to see the destruction that it does to relationships, to communities. They're at the core of unhealthy relationships. And they're not reflective of what it means to be part of the family of God. So the question is, how do we reflect a renewed heart and that life that we have in the spirit that he's just talked to us about? Surprisingly enough, what Paul says is, in order to combat that, we take the posture of a burden bearer. That's how we contrast that. We bear the burdens of others for the direct reason to bring about restoration. Paul goes on and says, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, and it could be brothers and sisters, it's not just for guys, since you know, all the guys are here, lot, and some ladies are here, but Wives are gone, so just the men don't need to hear this. All of us need to hear this. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watching yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. The gospel is a wonderful message. It's a message of God's unconditional love. It's a message of forgiveness and acceptance through what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross. But God's people, surprisingly enough, struggle with sharing that unconditional love, forgiveness, and acceptance with each other. We struggle with it. Years ago, um, a man named John Burke wrote a book about the church called No Perfect People Allowed. Some of you may have read it. It's, quite an, it's an older book now. It's probably 18 years old or 17 years old. That book was written on the premise of the fact that the early church clearly, clearly would not tolerate open rebellion in their midst that mocked God and hurt others. And they would deal with it. But in that early church, there was a deep patience and forbearance with one another because, as John Burke said, no one, absolutely nobody is perfect in the church. You aren't. You aren't. I'm not. 
Paul hypothetically gives a like, very likely scenario to us here. He says, someone, that someone could be your spouse. That someone could be a youth leader here. That someone could be an usher, your child. It could be the pastor. It could be a new attendee. Someone who was recently baptized. Someone, it says, is overtaken by, and he uses the word, transgression. Your other tr translations use a different word. But the word transgression, interestingly enough, one of the meanings of the word is to take a false step. Now you take that word and you relate it back to chapter 5, verse 25, where it says, keep in step with the Spirit. But someone might go out of step. Going back again to my youth pastor days. We put on a Christmas banquet the first year I was there. And we had volunteers. Volunteers who graciously made the food. Someone had made deep pans of deliciously chocolate goodness. I don't know what they were, but they were thick and deep and gooey. And we had taken those pans because we didn't have enough room in our fridges and we set them aside on the floor in an off-limited cold room at the church. When it was time for dessert, I went to get the pans of dessert and happened to find a youth-sized shoe print of a youth in the middle of the pan with a trail of chocolate going down the hallway. <laughs> Did that person mean to step in the dessert? No, I don't think so. They were just clowning around and going places they shouldn't have gone. Interestingly enough, when I came back, I looked under the table at everybody's shoes, but the person was wise enough to wash their feet off. <laughs> Anyways, most of us, we don't lie awake at night thinking about stepping into a pan of dessert or an impulsive response to someone that's hurtful. We don't think we're going to do that. Or to look over at someone else's exam. I didn't mean to do that. It just sort of happened. Or to get aggressive with a less than cooperative child. Whether it's a conflict, a temptation to lust, inattention that causes a serious car accident, even, even those with repetitive, addictive, wayward actions, most people that struggle with those don't want to give in to that. But they don't have the strength, and they often don't. They're not able to resist. And so they take and make a transgression. They step out of the boundary. Now, there's nothing in this statement that suggests people are not responsible for the consequences of the damages their actions might cause. But notice what our responsibility as the people of God and as their friends and as their family members, our responsibility toward each other when this happens. The word is restore. Our responsibility is restoration. Now, in the Bible, that word was used for a number of different things. One of the things that word is used for is to rebuild a wall that got knocked down. That word is used for when they mended the nets that were torn. Or the word is used in classical Greek literature to set a broken bone. It means literally for us to come alongside and help people get past the conflict to overcome the indiscretion, to help people not lose faith or give in despair or to live in perpetual guilt. It also means we avoid labeling them, casting them off to the side, or avoiding eye contact. Paul addresses those who are to do this. He says, you who are spiritual. Well, then you say, That's, I'm off the hook because I'm not spiritual. Who is that? Over and over throughout Galatians, we've been told that when we come to faith in Christ, we have what or who? We have the Spirit within us, and we are called to walk in the way of the Spirit. So you who are spiritual ones is every one of us 
who are part of the family of God. So that would mean the one who has direct knowledge of or contact with the one who has transgressed, we're to grieve in their lapse of judgment, in their ongoing struggle, their failure to be strong, and we're to be gracious in the faith they identify and desire to live out. Again, this is not somebody we're talking about who is rebellious and defiant. You don't find a lot of people like that. Well, I mean, there's a stage of life where there's a lot of rebellion and defiance as you learn your independence, but it's not the same. Don't assume that because someone believes in God that it comes naturally for us to do this. Remember the story in the Good Samaritan? Jesus pointed out that the smartest and most dedicated spiritual leaders, they wouldn't even go out of their way for a person who's struggling. It's hard for us. Many times we either ignore what happened or we react too harshly. Restoration requires us to be burden bearers. When someone feels ashamed, they need to know that there's forgiveness. When someone has lost trust, people need to come alongside to help them gain back trust. When someone has caused hurt, someone needs to come alongside to help bring the restitution. When a youth acts immaturely, there needs to be someone there to believe in them and just help them navigate that journey they're going through. I heard an interesting point about burden bearing as I was reflecting on this, and that it's a real simple point. If you're gonna bear a burden, it takes effort. <laughs> you know, if somebody's carrying a couch and they have one side and they say, can you help me? You have to help lift the couch. You literally have to help bear the burden. You have to help carry the burden to bear the burden, which means bearing burdens takes time, it takes resources, and it takes support. Now, to be honest, most of us just don't want to do that. It's a sacrifice, and that's the pastor's job or the other leader's job. It is a sacrifice, exactly. Just as Jesus bore our curse on himself, then he paid the debt of our sin. Yes, it's a sacrifice because that's what we have been given and that's what we share. This last part of the section is, focuses on we bear our own burdens to experience our redemption. Verses three to five. For if anyone thinks he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. Interesting passage. Paul addresses the real reason we hesitate to bear the burden of others. He just goes there first of all. He tells you and me why we, won't, we don't want to bear others' burdens. I didn't say this, but I'm going to repeat it. We don't think they deserve us. That we're actually better than them. You'd say, no, 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 I just don't feel worthy. No, you actually think you're better than them. The great deception that causes churches to be unloving is actually that our faith is personal. Because it's, it's my faith and I don't share it with others. No, you have faith, you're part of the family of God. You do share and you do care for others. Someone explained to me why we struggle with wanting to help others and I think this makes some sense. And I'll use my own life rather than attacking you, because I'll attack myself here. I'm someone who's grown up in church all my life. Nominally, went to church, but I still grew up in church all my life. I know I'm not perfect, but I've had a lot of things line up in my favor growing up. Probably a lot of you have too. Um, I had good training. I had role models. I got leadership development in my life. On a scale of one to 10, I probably could say today, I hate to say it, but I probably, I'm probably a five out of 10 spiritually with how far I have to go, so I, that's not bad. Compare me with someone who grew up outside the church and had a broken home or struggled with different things in their lives. Right now, 
as part of the family of God, they have the same status as I do. And they know they're not perfect. But instead of a five, maybe they're operating at a 3.5 out of 10. Here's the thing. I can look at myself and say, I'm at a five, and they're a 3.5. The thing is, they've probably come a lot farther to get 3.5 than I've come to get to five. Are they less along the way than I am? This is what Paul's talking about here. Considering they've had to endure way more hurdles than I've had to deal with? We're experts at comparing church sizes, the achievements of our kids, the leadership opportunities that we're given, our marriages and our school grades, and who's our friend. We've got to stop comparing ourselves to others that we're better than or that we're inferior to and realize we're in this together to help one another grow in our faith. Actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a, a kudo. Yesterday, the elders were meeting, and we, we actually met this weekend. We had a little retreat, and uh, one of the things I shared with them, we were talking about things we're celebrating. I celebrate all the people in this church who are not seen but who show acts of care and kindness to others. I know there's a lot of that going on, so let me just elevate that, but I just want to bring the text to our attention. Paul says that when we compare ourselves to others, what we need to do is we we got to get past that. we got to stop that. When we stop comparing ourselves, Paul says we'll have a posture of taking responsibility even for our own struggles in our life. And we'll be honest about the struggles in our lives, which means we won't be guarded against having, allowing someone to come alongside us. We won't just try to lift that couch by ourselves, even though we can't. We'll welcome others. I think one of the most evident ways of this is when we have space and community where we're known and accepted by others And we're open with them about our strengths, weaknesses, and desires. And we can't make it happen, but we try here to create those safe spaces through how they operate the midweek clubs for kids or youth groups, small groups, or the interactive Bible discovery classes that we have on Sundays, or the ladies' and men's gatherings that come together or the small group triads or the retreats like there are this weekend or there are at home conferences or even just the serving opportunities and through the interactive conversations we have with one another. Might we, might we be mindful to enter into conversations not just about what we're doing this coming week but the questions of how are you doing and then actually caring to listen or honestly answering that question when someone asks us. We come to faith from different circumstances. Each of us has his load. The transformation's different for each of us. And the baggage we deal with is so different. Jesus, though, was, remember, he was sitting around the fire talking with Peter about his future. And Peter's listening to him and then says, yeah, but Jesus, what about, what about John? And Jesus said, John has his own burden to carry, and you have yours. So don't confuse yours with John's. Stop comparing yourself. Get your eyes on Jesus, Peter. Might I also say the burden referred to in verse 2 is different than the verse spoken of in verse 5. One is a burden someone can't manage. They're just overwhelmed with it. They can't do it. While the other is the load you're expected to carry. And just by way of illustration, you'll understand this. You're a parent. You're about to take your child to an event somewhere, and you need to drive them, but the car doesn't start or has a flat tire. What do you do? And you call and say, can you please help and take my kids? That's bearing a burden. That's an unexpected burden. But that doesn't mean that person who picked up your kids will become the parent of those kids. You're still the parent. And you're entrusted with providing for and raising that child because you must bear your own burden. 
We come along and bear others' burdens, but we also have to bear our, burden, our own burdens. I asked you two questions at the be, at, about bear, bear, bearing burdens. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a mouthful. I want to ask you again. Do you know someone who's struggling right now? Got him? Got that there? Has some nagging doubts or... Have, you know, do they have nagging doubts? Have they created division with careless words? Have they made really poor financial decisions? Showed indiscretion in how they treated another person? As I said earlier, maybe it's a Christian friend, one of your kids, someone you serve with at church. How does that person's choices, you know, how, you know, first of all, how are they doing, right? How are they doing? Do they know they've messed up? How does that person's choices make you feel? Do you think they feel hopeless or hopeful? What can you do to help carry that burden? Pray, come alongside, lift something literally from their life and help them with it. Secondly, are you struggling right now? And I, and I, I can't help but think some of you are. The pressure of an important decision, maybe a lack of discipline to get into God's word, maybe some things you're hiding that you don't know, want anyone to find out because you're struggling so hard with them. Maybe you've misused finances. Um, maybe you just have an unresolved conflict you may love. Maybe you're just struggling with doubts and fear or anger or jealousy or just darkness. Will you welcome someone to help you carry that burden? It seems overwhelming until we understand the power of the gospel. And I just close with this. In downtown New York City, right in front of the Rockefeller Center, is a 45-foot bronze statue. Anyone know who that is? Any idea? Atlas? Heard of Atlas? Greek mythology? Mythology says that Zeus defeated Atlas and condemned him <coughs> excuse me, to a life of holding the world for all eternity. Now, it's a myth. But it was a weight too great to carry. That's all he could do was stand there and hold the world. Directly across the street from the statue is the entrance to St. Patrick's, Patrick's Cathedral. And literally 80 yards down the aisle Behind the high altar in that Catholic church is a three-foot high statue of the Christ child. What's in his hand? The world. He's holding the world in his hands. The burdens of this world to us seem so immense but in the hands of the one who gave his life for us. They're in his control. And he's the one who's able to lead us through them as he dearly loves us. As we close our time today, I'm going to just briefly pray and uh, some of the elders are gonna be up here. There'll be some individuals up here. If you just feel you need someone to pray with today, Front pews are available. I'm not going to bug the individuals, but if uh, you're just here today and, and just need to either talk with God, maybe, maybe you need to give your life to him. Maybe you've been holding that back as well and just need to talk about what it means to, to live in the life of Christ. We would love to talk to you this morning. So after I pray, we're going to close the service. We're dismissed to interact and mingle. And some of you will stay in here and visit. Some of you will go in the foyer. But if you'd like to come up here, we would love to pray with you this morning. So let's pray together. Father, um, thank you for these words. They fit very appropriately with some of the things that people are facing around us that we've prayed about already today. And uh, there's some immense things. And so I ask that even just today, um, that we would, we would be mindful of how we, um, we bear with, but we also allow others to bear with us. And uh, you've called us to this, and uh, you give us hope through your Son, our living Savior. Go with us as we go from here this week as well. 
that we would be the light of the world to a world that desperately needs to know that there is light and life through you. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Just quickly here. Um, oh, yeah, I already had that. Thank you. All right, we're done. Thank you. If you want to come up, we'll gladly pray with you this morning. Thank you.